Welcome back to our Cancha podcast. And if you're disappointed that Taj isn't the one saying this, I'm disappointed too. <laughs> anyway, you know, the Champions League final was um, this last Saturday. Manchester City have won the Champions League for the first time and they've also competed a treble. So they're the second English team to do that. So congratulations to them. So here with me is Taps and Adura to discuss the final and some other things after. So I want to start with Taps. What what I want to start with both of you. First Taps, what was your take on the final as a whole? Uh, it was actually a good final for me. It was closer than I expected the game to be. I think on the night, we could probably say Simone and Zaghi won the tactical battle. But at the end of the day, uh, Pep's team was able to get over the line. I think the two people that impressed me the most was John Stones in the midfield and Andre Onana for Inter on the other side of it. But it was it was a much closer final than I expected it to be. Yeah, Adira? Yeah, I think it was a very, it was a very close contest, to be very honest. And a lot of people actually would in town before the game or to run. You know, I think they shocked a lot of people that particularly. And as um as Pap said, it was a very, very, very close game. And a game which was won in moments because that game could have gone to any anyone who just things in that particularly. Once it were just very lucky. So I've got to raise it. Yeah, I mean in the Champions League, like it's a, it's a league of football is a game of fine margins, and the Champions League is the best example of it because you yeah. know. Um, but what do you guys think of um Inter's approach overall? Because Inter really started giving City problems only when they went behind. Do you think it was by design, or it's because of Lukaku's substitution? I think it was by design because this is sort of the same way that we saw Inter approach all their other knockout ties where they start the game with Lautaro and Dzeko and then off the bench you'd normally then see uh, it would be Lukaku, Brozovic, those were the players that they were normally bringing on. So I think it was by design that they were going to attack more in the second half but then I think in the first half they probably didn't expect to have as much sort of control as they did because I haven't seen Man City misplay so many passes in a game this season. The City players sort of looked a bit shaken every time they were through on goal, like all the shots were just like straight at Onana early on in the game. And I think Inter ended up being, you know, a little more comfortable than they anticipated. So now when you had Lukaku coming on, so Inter would now start counterattacking a bit more you saw them get a few more chances. And and honestly, even what we saw from the XG, I think Inter had the better chances on the night, but they just couldn't make the most of them. Yeah, I would agree because from a Manchester City perspective, the only big chances they really had beside the goal were the Holland won the first half. And Holland, Foden. yeah, and Foden. And Holland yeah. one was straight at the goalkeeper as well. Yeah. Foden could have even done better with the shot, but anyway, Adura, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think as as Tap said, it was by design here. The whole general gameplay from the onset throughout the tournament, throughout the season, as you you know, in that fast paced counter attack sitting behind and it was kind of shocking to see them have possession that particularly. But I do think that if Inter use their possession well on Saturday, they could have probably got to with the ring there, especially in the first half. They had some nice build up with the end there of wasting due to probably some little little mistakes or some by fine margins, you know. And it was it was their game to win, actually, in my honest opinion. From what I saw, I, I felt like yeah, Inter had more control, Inter had the edge against Man City, you know. But yeah, it was actually nice to see a team that most people are dressing up actually put up a fight, you know, even if they did not win. And you know, and like cut of the underdog story and be like, oh yeah, these people can actually put up a fight towards Man City. You know, Man City are not like a very big unstoppable team, regardless of what happened on Saturday. Yeah, I would agree. Personally, I feel the only thing Inter got wrong in the first half, like you said, was some decision making because they had some good build up moments and. I felt like if Jerko and Lautaro could have switched what they were doing, it would have been better because 
you had Lautaro winning the flick ons and then Jeku trying to run after them. I'm like, that doesn't look right. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. And they had so so much bad decision making from Lautaro on the night as well. So. Yeah. And speaking of strikers, like, you know, Lautaro, he has this kind of game in him where he just does not. But, you know, I, for me, there are two kinds of bad. There's a bad that you don't notice, which was also Haaland, to be fair. It wasn't a good day for strikers. <laughs> and there's a bad that is so loud and obvious, and it will be remiss of me and us not to talk about it. So who wants to take the first stab at wrong with it? <laughs> That's actually true. I'll I'll jump in here. And I and I like how you phrased it, that there's a bad that you don't notice and a bad that you notice. Because I feel like that's where we saw Lautaro and Holland were probably the bad that we didn't notice because they had some terrible decision making. And then maybe Lukaku is the bad that we noticed because his chances were just, oh, they were so perfect. And I think if he just had a little more confidence in him and... It was just one of those nights for him. It felt like their their game against Croatia yeah. <laughs> in the World Cup. Like, yes, just yes, not it with that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you guys know I love watching a lot of anime, right? So there's this anime called Blue Lock where it's about creating Japan's next best striker. Actually, creating yeah. the best striker in the world. After the game, on the Blue Lock subreddit, someone posted a picture of Butaka and they were like, even Blue Lock wouldn't improve this guy. <laughs> I'm like, damn. <laughs> And I feel I feel so bad for him, right? Because like he did so much good on the night to get exactly. into positions. Yeah, it's just that that final final touch was missing. But like everything else, he did better than Jekyll. Exactly. Arguably, and yeah. You could make the, you could make the argument like why didn't he start over Jekyll? Well, for me, I wanted Jekyll to start because like that's how Inter got into the final, and you know Lukaku is yeah. There's no need to to change what's working and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. And from a Lukaku standpoint, he does have too many of these games, doesn't he, Adura? Yeah, he does, you know. And I think, in my opinion, I, I think Lukaku is very unjustly criticized. I think he does have good games. Probably he's just unlucky in front of goal. His Fair form enough. leading up to... Yeah, I think he, he does have good games, you mm-hmm. know. He does have this like great run of form. His form leading up to this final was actually good. And I yeah. think he has been unjustly mm-hmm. criticized in moments like this, especially for the Dimaku chance last week. A lot of people blamed it on him, but there was nothing he could have done in that situation, you know. Although Lukaku, yeah. Lukaku has he has bad games, he has games where oh yeah, you expect him to really take all those chances and all that. But I feel like yeah, sometimes we need to look beyond you miss chances and look and look at what he brings to the game. Yeah. And just this because we know he has his abilities. Lukaku is a, is a satisfied goal scorer. He scores goals for a living. He has done it time and time and time and time again. Over yeah. at this inter two seasons ago. Yeah, so I, I, I just feel yeah, it, 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 it's a thing that his confidence will grow over time, you know. And as you said, he had a better game than Lautaro and Jekyll. But then it was one that people people criticized more and people did not notice the Lautaro's shameful performance that particular day. But in any case, I felt the most shameful performance from the per- most shameful performances from an inter point of view are from Barrea and especially Chal Noto. Like I don't know why he was on for so long. I know Mikitarian was not really fit. Uh, Dum- Dumfries, to be up to be fair to Dumfries, like some of the passes. Dumfries and, didn't have a bad game. Right? And he the build up did really go to his side and Inter was so obsessed with um, trying to give the ball to Di Marco when it was really obvious that City were trapping them to give it to him. And I think this is where we can segue into City. So, who for you guys, who stood up for the citizens? For me, uh, like I said, I think John Stones was probably my most... Like, John Stones and Rodri, those are the two players that stood out for me. And... Rodri, in a sense, sort of had a quiet game where he was quietly just dictating the game, the tempo. Those sort of games that we used to see from Busquets, you know, when the cliche of, like, you don't notice him, but he's mm-hmm. quietly doing his job. And I think Rodri was very good. And then Stones, for me, Stones was just surprising. Like, the fact that 
Pep just quietly converted him into a midfield <laughs> as the season went on mm-hmm. has been something that's like sort of fixed up City's team because I think last year one thing they didn't have was a lot of composure when the team had their backs against the wall and this year they've managed to sort of lock that in changing to the formation with the three center backs and then having stones pushing up in there to help Rodri and then also freeze Rodri to then get into more attacking runs in the box and as you can see Rodri starts scoring more yeah but there for me yeah I, I love players that can that can play well under pressure you know I really love Donana's performance in that particular the win winning side or losing or losing side you know his performance is exceptional he really helps the team that day it is play under pressure being able to escape pressure being able to take pressure of the center box and all that it was like a really beautiful game for him and i think more, almost everybody who watched that game they actually surprised that oh yeah he does have this he does have this quality you know and like yeah. beautiful beautiful the way he instilled it the way, the way he ex- exerted it in this game is dominant over the ball is dominant over the build up in the game it was actually beautiful to watch you know I think I love that. Uh, like, Onana is so good with the ball at his feet that he went to war with his coach over during the World Cup. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, for, for a Manchester City point of view, like, how big is this for them? Like, not only have they come back from a disadvantaged position in the table, they also won the FA Cup final and now they've won their first Champions League. What are I your think- thoughts? Yeah. I think it's massive for them. And I think especially the way that they won the two cup finals, they didn't like dominate and impose themselves. They sort of just had to win ugly. And that's something that I myself have personally criticized them over the years, right? Mm-hmm. With pep teams where pep teams tended to be vulnerable in finals. And I've always said, you know, you just have to have a spine, but I never knew like whether it would be personnel changes or system changes, but they just needed that cutting edge. And I think this season, we saw them sort of just basically lock in and they went on their usual winning run towards the end of the season. Uh, we saw Pep change the system. Early on in the year, right, he he hadn't committed to this, uh, the four center backs across the line with Stones coming in. Yeah. I think they only started doing that maybe like January, I think. Okay. And we started to see them different approaches in the, I think I mentioned this after the buy-in games where the way they approached each away tie in the knockouts was very different from the way they approached the, the away ties last year. So I think for them, this will be very important for them. Again, they've become the second team in England to win a treble. And yeah, they they basically played everyone off the park. I don't think there was a single team besides Inter that was close to them, to be honest. Because Madrid, they played us off the park. Bayern was played off the park. Uh, Leipzig was played off the park. If we go back to in their FA Cup run, I think they only conceded a penalty. And that was the the penalty against United. I think they hadn't conceded a goal (laughs) elsewhere in the competition. So, yeah. For for City fans, I'm sure it'll be a very historic one. Uh, Three three league titles in a row and a treble to, to sign it off. I think it'll be a good one for them. I just don't know where maybe Pep himself would place this. In comparison to what he did with the Barca sides, I'm not too sure how he would feel on a on a individual level, but City will be very happy. Yeah. Adora, what do you think of Pep? Like, is he the goat as some people have said, or you know, is he still a fraud? Because hey, this is expected of Man City, right? <laughs> so what is t- tell us what you think of Pep now? I I have I have a Moreno bias, yeah. I have a Moreno bias. Understandably. <laughs> Currently, yeah, uh, I don't think there's any manager in the world that can lay, that can lay claim to what Pep has done, or, or can, or can, that can lay Pep's with. To be very honest with you, yeah, Pep is performing exceptionally well, and I think this is like the climax for both Pep and Manchester City. You know, I wonder where they go for me. Probably they keep that consistency. Pep renews his contract with his last leave, regardless what he has done. He has etched his name into the history books in Manchester. You know. When Alex Ferguson had that, had that treble, when people were like, oh, yeah, this is a very few, you know, one of the greatest things ever happened, you know, from Alex Ferguson, you know, but Pep has done it, you know, although it has taken time because I feel like most people expected this very early or earlier in the, in the Man City, probably that um, season, 2021, 2022, 
when he mm. lost the Champions League final to Chelsea. But I feel like, yeah, he has been winning this league consistently, consistently. And in the last seven years, just lost it twice to Liverpool. And I think that his first season, I don't think there's any coach in the entire world that can say they've been that dominant everywhere they've been to, every single club, every single country, every single league, every single tournament. No one just say, where are you, man? Pep, Pep is the man, you know. Pep, Pep really is the man. And yeah. yeah, despite that bias, you know, I just I just have to say it, yeah. He's yeah. doing wonders. And people and some people, some people might say, oh yeah, he has his watches, he has he has a lot of money, he has a lot of money, you know, for transfers and all that. But but there's but there's there's more to this, there's more to this than that, you know. He's innovative. The three man, the three, the three back line with um stones at the DM2, that's the innovation, you know. He thinks of new things. He's bringing up new ideas. Just literally spent six hundred million and, and couldn't do anything with it throughout the season. Exactly. <laughs> At the most miserable season ever. Manchester you know, so like, United like, spend a lot of money too, and you have Yeah, Manchester United well. spent a lot of money also, and like a fourth place finish at Carabao Cup is all all they could settle for. All they could settle for. The Europa League against Sevilla. At that point, they were battling relegation. United couldn't do anything against them. So I feel like yeah. Pep, Pep is a mastermind. He's a, ta- he's a tactical genius. You have to give him his flowers. Uh, for me, one of the things I liked about his post match interviews was, was like this Champions League title has validated all of the league titles that Man State have won. And I'm like, you know, that's really true because for me, winning a league consistently like that is super hard. And yes, Man City have access to machines while other people play with like spades and toy shovels but you still have to make good signs you still have to have a good project and you still have to apply yourself and even though Pep can overthink sometimes like playing no defensive midfielder in the final or playing three defensive midfielders against Leon the man is clearly on a different level like 36 major trophies as a manager and he started in 2008, it's just phenomenal. As for these good claims, I don't know, I still have a couple of people ahead of me, but we'll see. Anyway, shall we move on to the superior European final? <laughs> sure. Yeah, the Conference League, which West Ham won against Fiorentina. I didn't watch this game, admittedly, so you guys tell me what you thought about it. Right, so for this one, it was it was a good game. It wasn't as entertaining as the intensity for me, um, although there was a bit of a, a shame to see the West Ham fans uh, throwing things on the pitch, being mm-hmm. rowdy. We had the incident where Biragi was bleeding from his head, so you never want to see those kind of scenes in a final. Like fans just need to calm down. Like you know, we're here for football. We're not here for all the nonsense. Um, I think on the night, I would say Fiorentina probably won the midfield battle. Uh, I think their midfield was Amrabat, um, Mandragora, and Bonaventura. They they probably dominated the game a lot more than many would have expected. Although West Ham, I think, being the better squad overall, the better team in the competition, they showed their quality. They did need a little bit of luck because the handball was a bit controversial for me because... It technically is a handball, but it's one of those handballs that I personally wouldn't give because I feel like humans we don't we don't move like penguins, right? Our arms are always going to when you're jumping or when you're running, right? Your arms are always gonna move around. So I feel like there needs to be a little bit of a balance. And we've spoken about this in La Liga as well, where you kind of have to look at intent a little bit, but I do know, of course, the rules changed. So now basically every handball is a handball, regardless of your intention or not. So it is the correct call before, <laughs> before people get on me, it's the correct call, but I just feel like, you know, it's harsh on the, what's it called again? The spirit of the game. Yeah. I wouldn't give it on in the spirit of the game, but yeah, overall on the night, I think probably Nico Gonzalez was the best player in my opinion. Um, he created the the second goal for he created the the goal for the equalizer for Fiorentina uh dropping it down for Bonaventura he probably had the best chances on the night but ultimately Fiorentina couldn't hold on and i think the way they conceded the last goal in the 90th minute will hurt them <laughs> because all they just had to do was keep the ball 
but it was a bit of a loose ball in the middle of the field and then it was a through ball to Bowen, Jared Bowen, I think. And then he just went through on goal and tapped it in. Um, maybe the Fiorentina defender could have taken a red card and taken the game to extra time, but I think, yeah, he kind of hesitated on that one. So I think it was an okay final. It wasn't as entertaining as the Intercity game, but the better team ended up winning because I think West Ham were overall better than Fiorentina throughout the tournament, I would say. Yeah. Uh, Doria, David Moyes has a European trophy. Did you see this coming <laughs> 10 years ago when he was declared the chosen one? <laughs> at all I think I think it's it's actually very nice to see how he has turned his career around you know from being the uh, the successor to Alex Ferguson to going to Sunderland Royal Society I don't know which one came before the other you know, and failing in good jobs. yeah and, and failing in both jobs not doing exceptionally well then coming to West Ham and doing a really good job you know taking them to the conference league and I think in, in this situation the conference league has served its purpose, you know, it has brought um, this thing, what they call it, the joy, the truth of winning an European trophy, whether it's third tier or second tier, it has brought that truth for the joy of winning an European trophy too. So this type of themes, you know, I think this type of themes deserve to feel this type of joy, you know, and all of that, you know. So it's it's, it's a big thing, you know, regardless of where, where, wherever I rank, you know, in the ranking, it's actually a big thing for these fans, it's a big thing for this team, you know, and it kind of ele elevates them, it gives them that status. They've won a trophy, their first European trophy in how many years? David Moyes' first trophy in... Yeah, probably like 40 war. years, I think, yeah. Exa exactly, you know. I think it's, it's actually very nice, you know, and, and despite their shameful or embarrassing season, one can say, yeah, okay, they won the trophy, you know, they won the conference league, they played against some of some of Europe's big teams, or at least Europe's mid decent teams. And a final against Fiorentina was not a walkover, you know. The final was actually competitive to an extent. I kind of agree with everything Tap said, you know, and like, yeah, it was a very good thing. It was a very good thing to see at the end of the day. Yeah. But you have some people, right? And these people, they believe the conference that shouldn't be for teams for the from the big five European leagues because it's kind of unfair. What do you guys think? I think I agree with that. In my very honest opinion, in my opinion, I, I agree with the fact that yeah, the top five leagues should not have representation in the conference league. Because yeah, the conference league is for it's for things like this, it's for it's for them on this thing. The Bates Boy solve the little grades of, of, of your opinion. Unfortunately, due to their coefficients, they, can, they cannot make their um, this thing, the Europa mm -hmm. League or the Champions League um, consistently. And I feel like this competition gives them the opportunity, you know, to actually lay a claim or, or lay safe or give them that pathway to the Europa League, you know, as, as winners, you know, winners get into the Europa League and all of that. I think it makes perfect sense and it gives them more income. It lets the teams actually need that income, get that income, not just the big teams, you know, probably teams like um, this thing. Like Chelsea, if, if Chelsea manages to squeeze into a seventh place, they don't deserve to go to the conference league. They don't deserve to come battling with teams. It seems I can't spend 10% of what they spent in the transfer window. And I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah, I would agree as well. I think as much as I'm happy for teams like West Ham and Roma to win it, they are squads way too qualified in terms of like the competition of the field so i do agree with everything that both of you said i think maybe what they should do is drop the the position and maybe like put 10th place in the top five leagues into there somewhere there like to just balance it out a little bit more i don't know but yeah i do feel like anytime these teams drop into the competition as much as they're playing against other teams of similar quality, they are over overpowered in terms of the resources, yeah. Yeah, I kind of agree. But at the same time, it's not in the UEFA. The UEFA is not going to do what we said, so it's what it is. In any case, congratulations to West Ham, congratulations to Manchester City, commiserations to Fiorentina and Inter. You know, they really put up a good fight and a good show I had good tournaments so now we're not done we're not done we still have to grade the La Liga teams and boy mm -hmm. I like you I've prepared for this one so we are going to do that right now 
Okay, so we got news of the we can start with the La Liga player of the season. It seems that he's been given to Mark Andre Testegan for his fine goalkeeping displays and his record breaking Zamora and clean shoot, and he matched the clean shoot record. I don't remember the person who shares the record, forgive me, but he's had a really good season. Well, what do you guys think of the decision in quotes? I'll let Adura go first on this one. Okay. I think he deserved it. And I also like the fact that there's a kind of um, this thing, a stop in giving um, the best attacker of the season, the player of the season, you know. There's this culture of always giving the best attacker the player of the season. And I think it's very mm-hmm. nice to actually see that. Yeah, for, for once, there's a change. And yeah, someone that actually does deserve it because of his performances gets the award. The second had a very beautiful season, although at the end of the season, he kind of like started being shaky, you know, considering some goals. But I feel like, yeah, that was, one, that was a performance for the history books. This season, this season was a performance for the history books. Although some people would say Griezmann does deserve a claim or can, can lay claims to the MVP of the season now, but I think the second just edges it out for me, you know? Yeah. It was extraordinary this season. Yeah, it's perfect that Adura mentioned Griezmann because I was going to say slightly a little bit of my bias on Griezmann. <laughs> I would have maybe given him the award, but I think what negates Griezmann is that he was coming off the bench at the beginning of the season, so he wasn't really a starter when Atleti were having their little uh, tuffle with Barcelona about paying for him. So I think, again, Ter Stegen is a deserved winner. I think he was the most important player for Barcelona this season. Uh, he managed to basically find his form again. This is the old Ter Stegen that we got used to. So I do think he's very deserving. But I would have been slightly biased because Griezmann's second half of the season was crazy. So <laughs> that's the only reason why I guess maybe I lean to Griezmann a little bit. I mean, that's, I mean, that's very fair, obviously. This season has been a really, really long season. Like, so you have teams that were literally really good in the first half and then after the World Cup, it became a completely yeah. different team. So yeah. lots, of, lots, lots of things that happened. For me, why I give it to Ter Stegen is of, for the reasons you mentioned. Of why I wouldn't give it to Griezmann despite his great performances is because, how do I put this? He didn't really do too much. I, I, like Atleti, Atleti's, Atleti were papering over the cracks. Atleti were papering over the yeah. cracks. <laughs> they had such a poor start, yeah, but then it, they were electric. It, basically, it's like a case of, and there's another team I'm going to talk about, about how the ending makes you forget the beginning, but in that team's case, the ending <laughs> actually led to something almost miraculous. So, with Atleti's case, we'll get to them later, but I feel like because Griezmann's goals and his great performances ultimately, after this season, you're, you're going to be like, okay, what did they really do for this team? Like, whatever goal they were chasing, you know? That kind, it's that kind of team where you like, you sadly only remember the winners or the people that contributed to something. So, yeah. And for Griezmann, it is funny that for all of his great achievements, he still hasn't won a big title. Yeah, man, and I feel sorry for him because what he went to Barca when Atleti won it, and then now he's back in it. But I feel like it was it was the universe punishing him because I remember when he made that move to Barca. He should have stayed at Atleti. I yeah, I was against him going to Barca, not because I hate Barca or anything like that, but I felt like him and Atleti were a match made in heaven. Like, why break that up? But he broke that up in chasing like a meaningless title. And then they didn't end up getting the title in the end. And then, so he comes back to the fairy tale. But maybe, maybe they'll have another shot at winning the title. Who knows if they keep their Unpopular form. opinion. Unpopular opinion. He wins this league next season. This coming season. This man wins the league. He leaves the league title. You think Unpopular they keep their form up? I think they will keep their form up. If, if that's, that's if Simeone doesn't make the regular changes he makes at, at the beginning of the season after they had a very good second half of the season. Where he does like all these little, little changes. I think that I know is really to you, but unpopular opinion. I think Atleti wins next season in Liga. That's, that's a really a that's a really bold claim. But anyway, 
I think we can do another, maybe sometime in the summer we'll do a prediction video. Like things have to happen. In any case, let's start with the team that actually won it. I'm, I'm happy they won it, Barcelona. So Barcelona season, they won the first league title in four years. They got to a cup semifinal. They won the Spanish Super Cup, and they messed up in the Champions League group stage again and got knocked out of the Europa League. So overall, how do you grade your season? And in uh, terms of like A, B, C, whatever. Yeah, I would give them an A actually because I feel like they did well to win the league title. And at the beginning of the season, that's probably one of the aims they were going for uh, when they made all the signings and, you know, the whole joke about all the palancas and everything. <laughs> they were literally doing it right for the league title. Mm -hmm. So even though I think, you know, the exits in the European competitions were a bit disappointing, I think going into the season, if you asked a Barca fan what their expectations would have been, maybe I don't you you're here to tell us, but maybe I would have said they wanted to challenge for the title and then maybe go deep in a European competition, not necessarily win it. So I think I would give them an A because I think Xavi kind of over, um, and I'm saying overperformed. He did really well in terms of with what he was given, and I like how he ended up changing the system sort of halfway into the system. Uh, into the season with the four midfielders because he had to sort of concede that in big games Barca was giving up too many chances and they needed to become a little bit better defensively and so I think we saw that takeover even though it didn't happen in the European competitions be it injuries or you know missing personnel that kind of thing I I'd give Barca an A for the season okay. I'll say six over ten wow <laughs> <laughs> Can't explain. I have, I have, I have that's reason. harsh. I, that's I really have, harsh. But, hey, I have, I, have, I have reasons. I have reasons, you know. I, I like to hear the reasons. But Boston's league win, I don't think it was exceptional. I, I don't think there, there was, there was any, anything that much. Although they did win the league, you know. Kudos to them, they did win the league, you know. But then in, in the Champions League, he dropped out of the Champions League in a group, in a group with um, Bayern, Inter, Victoria, Pleasant. He lost them um, this team in the Europa League to Manchester United, a team which he should supposedly be very better than. Or he, he lost, they lost Champions League, Europa League, out of Champions League, out of Europa League. Copa de Rey, they didn't get to the final. That's three competitions. They did win the Super Copa too, though, and they won the, uh, the league. But then, I, I feel like an, an eight. That's too generous because they had they had terrible performances. This is especially in Europe. They performed terribly in Europe. Although I, 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 I am I, I also can't wait to see what they what they have to offer next season. But for this season, I think this is this season wasn't wasn't the best. It wasn't the best league win that you could that you could have out there. You know, it wasn't like a very exceptional league win. It was just there and partly due to Madrid's. Terrible season, also. Fair enough. Anyway, um, that's a you heard it, guys. <laughs> Adira doesn't like wrestling. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but well, for me, right? I as much as I'm disappointed about the Champions League exits, the Europa League really couldn't care less. But the Champions League one was the one that I liked. I was annoyed by, even though, yes, there were injuries and the like fixture list was contested and whatnot, like you required a bit better. And I feel like the Champions League was down to the players just missing big chances against Bayern. Like Landowski and Pedri could have scored a brace each at the at um, the Allianz Arena. Not, I'm not even joking there. And things could have been different. But anyway, I feel like winning the league in a very convincing fashion, even though, yes, some of the games were boring. But, you know, you still have to win, so I give us an A. I was going to say minus before, but when I thought about just the context of all the off-the-pitch nonsense we've had to deal with and how that could really distract someone, I'm like, okay, I'll give it an A. So, let's focus on Real Madrid now. And I've seen a lot of polarizing opinions on this one. So what do you guys think? 
Uh, for me, I would give us a B. Uh, only because going in... But I would say I'd give us a B given my expectations, right? So this is my caveat. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because going into the season, I expected us to defend the league title. And then I expected us to get to the Champions League semis. And then I didn't know what was going to happen in Copa del Rey because we're always garbage in Copa del Rey. So yeah. that one I always sort of throw away at the beginning of the season. So I would say for me, we were we were somewhat on par with what we did last year uh, up until towards the end. Because if we looked at a points per game uh, comparison, we were basically, I think, one point behind what we were doing last season. The only difference was that Barcelona was better this year. So that's where I think there's a little caveat of where I also give Barcelona leniency because if it weren't for them, right, there would have been no other challenge of this season in terms of uh, the pace that we were going on up until a certain point when we lost the the classic one and everything fell apart yeah. <laughs> from there. So I would give us a B because we're getting to the Champions League semifinals, although we did lose in, in a bad manner. I think that was okay for us. So for me, the biggest disappointment is that we didn't defend our league title. That's where I think we should have done a lot better, uh, because the title was there. Not to the title wasn't there to be won, but it was there to be challenged. Like we should have done a lot better in the league. And I think as the season went on, Ancelotti started rotating and giving players a lot more chances that he should have given them early on in the season. So there was a bit of a over reliance on on the old guard in the league in my opinion so so i would say a b b b minus maybe yeah mm-hmm. uh, there? um i i might i might be, i might be terrible at this numbers game yeah but i'll just i'll just use words to describe it i think madrid probably had like one of the worst types of defenses i've seen in recent years you know so first half of the season the first half of the season wasn't wasn't bad wasn't excellent but it was okay. But the second half of the season was just what's going on here. Like your Madrid, yeah, 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 yeah. Literally the defending champions, you know. And like I was, it was surprising to see they lost to Villarreal to at, at um La Ceramica. I think yeah, they did lose to Villarreal. They lost to Villarreal at Benabal yeah. too again. I think so. It was like what's going on? Why why is Madrid fumbling like this? You know, the same thing on the European stages. I think the, the only the only green um this thing the only green thing about about their season was Copa de Rio win against Osasuna. And as aside as that, yeah. What yeah. else? Yeah, no. Title but... defense. Mm-hmm. Or um Champions League defense. The champion yeah. um, defend defending defending champions of the Champions League defended that terribly, powering out to Manchester City in disappointing fashion. I feel like the Spanish elites or Spain's elite teams are actually disappointing this season. Yeah. Okay, so this one I struggled with because I was thinking about like the terrible league defense and getting to the semi finals is still a success in some terms. But the way, so I didn't really allow the way they went out to like slow my judgment. So at first I was like a C, plus, but then I thought about it. I'm like, you know what, the cup needs to be respected more. I think. Them winning it the way they did, like you could see there was a team with how they always came back from adversity in the cup. So I felt like that was a really good cup win. And also, there's another team that I feel people overlooked. Real Madrid's league form up to the classical in March was not bad. They were actually pound for pound doing a point or two less than what they yeah. did. The <laughs> That's league. why I give us a lot the of issue <laughs> yeah. was that we we're not just conceding goals at all. Like we were, I think if we hadn't taken that, if you hadn't like literally relaxed after we won the league, we would have broken 100 points. So I feel like that's the kind of season their rival was having. So I can't really blame them too much there. Yes, they should defend the league better, but when you're doing around the same as you did last year and the other team is on steroids, I'm like, there's not really much you can do. So yeah, I'd say B minus. Now for Atletico, I'm going to start with this one. I'm going. To, I know a lot of people will hate me for this. A lot of people will be like, "But the second half of the season was great." I'm like, "Yes, it was great, but when they had nothing to play for, you know." So for me, I'm not going to be fooled by the 
second half, I'm going to give him a C because when you look at it, like getting bottom in a group that at this point I was dying for. <laughs> I'm like, please, I don't want burn. I, I really want this group at Let's see have, and then they absolutely fumbled it with some terrible away performances. Yeah. I don't know if in the cup I felt like the club they did well, they lost to the eventual winners, but overall they didn't even get third at second in the end. So it's a C or maybe C plus. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head for this one. I'd also give them a C plus purely in terms of like a, a full picture, like we said, in the Champions League it's it's basically unforgivable to get eliminated from that group if you're Atleti with the resources that you have. Mm -hmm. And then in the cup competitions, yeah, we can give them a pass on that, just like the other teams. But yeah, second half of the season was a completely whole new team. And so I don't know if it's it was Simeone changing things or if it was, you know, the personnel changes that we saw with uh, Felix heading out. Uh, who else left? Uh, Cunha Felipe? and Lodi. Cunha, no, uh, oh, Cunha and Lodi as well. Yeah, so I'm not too sure. That, so I'm interested to see if going into next season they keep this form up or if they, they dip up. And like Adura mentioned, or if Simeone tweaks a little bit and, you know, they end up dropping off. So I would give them a C-plus as an overall picture. If they had not been eliminated in the Champions League and they go to the knockouts, and maybe eventually lost to like a Napoli or something like that, maybe I would have given them a B-plus. Because the that getting knocked out of that Champions League group was unforgivable, in my opinion. Yeah. Are there? I think I, I can't disagree with what Bobby have said, you know. That Champions League group, I think how easy it has been for people to actually forget what Atleti actually did in the Champions League this season. That's unforgivable. That's unforgivable. Giving the the teams, the teams in their group and they went and finished last. Finished last, dead last. I wasn't even expecting much from them in the Copa del Rey, to be very honest, because in the past few seasons, they've been having this amount of performances in the Copa del Rey. But that Champions League campaign they had this season was terrible. Their first half of the season, poor. Although they did, they did pick up in the second half of the season. And I still maintain that if they carry on that form into next season, they might actually be league, league winners next season. But yeah, it was terrible this season. And yeah, given that, you know, if you it's it's a 38 game season and you can't just say oh because they had them a very good them second half of the season second 19 yeah. games you know against give them like oh yeah one of the best performances of the season that's a lie you know so yeah i'll also give them a c yeah well in agreement on that one <laughs> so we also said that i think given the fact that they successfully stayed in the top four this time and despite some wobbly moments and you know, to be fair, they had a little help from the inconsistency of the teams below them. I think this deserves a very, very solid day. Yeah, I would agree with you on this one. I would slightly say A minus, just to punish them a little bit because they did try their best to give up that top four position. <laughs> like they they were trying. Like if it, like you mentioned, if it wasn't for the inconsistency of the teams behind them, they would have gifted someone like Villarreal, that fourth spot. So I will, you know, take a few points off of that. But overall, the rest of their season was flawless. Uh, they were the, one of the best teams this season. Uh, Zubimendi was perfect in midfield. We had Lerno Marand. Uh, Sorlot was finally coming alive. Kubo had a great season as well. So I, I think, yeah, they checked all the boxes. If, if they went into the season aiming for top four, they got top four. And for once they didn't have their second half season collapse. Um, so like I was mentioning, they, they did shake a little bit, but they didn't collapse at least. The human being said we are going to finish it. And that human being feels really stupid now. <laughs> anyway, Adora, what do you think? I think I, think I agree with you, Oscar. Yeah. You'll give, I'll give them an A. You know? I was expecting um, Sasada to actually have the second half of the season deep you know, after the World Cup. They did have shaky performance. They lost to Barras Valencia to at the at atmosphere. They had shaky performances and all that, but I think they picked themselves up very well. One person I was actually shocked or disappointed with and the second half of the season was Bryce Mendes, you know. First half yeah, of the season. He was having, 
Yeah, he dropped off. First of all, the season was having player of the season shouts, you know, MVP of the season, you know, Bria and this thing. New, um, new shine, I mean, breakthrough, breakthrough player of the season. But then, after December, he didn't score a goal until the last game of the season. It was kind of terrible, you know. Yeah. But the player, their MVP, the player that, that gave the most performance, that gave the best performances, they all the together was Faki Kubo, you know. In the absence of where the ball is regular, and beats for passes each season because because of his injury and all of that fitness issues. I think Kubo was actually the one that glued the team together and and took them to that fourth that fourth position. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I'm not even considering their Europa League regular last 32 or right, right around of 16 knockouts team. I'm already used to it at this point. But I will say <laughs> kudos to them for topping their group. That was something I was like. They and Betis should aim to do, and they both did it. It's just it didn't really go any further than that, but you know, yeah. So for these net from here on, I think for teams that had similar seasons, we'll just group them together for the sake of speed. So yep, sure. Villarreal and Betis both got into the Europa League positions. How, what do you think about their seasons? Uh, for me, I would give Villarreal C, and maybe I'd give Betis a D because I honestly expected them to do much better. Their disciplinary record this season was <laughs> was horrendous. Uh, I don't know what caused the drop off. They did have, you know, a couple of injuries. They did lose Fakir. They lost uh, Canales as well. So uh, it was one of those seasons for them. So for Betis, I'll give them a D, despite them, you know, finishing in a Europa League spot. I expected them to push the the teams in the Champions League positions. And then Villarreal, the same, I would say. Early on, they did start a bit shaky with Unai Emery, and then to give Setien a little bit of credit, he did do better than I expected him to do when he came in. Uh, but I still think Villarreal has another gear in them, so that's probably why I would get them a C. I think they can do better than they than they have. Okay, before I get to Adira, my ratings for two of them were really different from yours. <laughs> but, yeah, what did you give them? <laughs> okay, I gave them both a B minus because I decided to put context, right? I'm like, yeah. Villarreal, by all rights, in terms of social mass, is a small club in Spain. Yet they have the achievements of a top club in Spain, and you know, fair play to them. Let's put them aside for now. Betis. Yeah, they kind of stagnated and you expected them to get to that fourth spot when we all knew Sevilla wouldn't get top four at the start of the season. We're like, okay, who will get this? And we all felt better, but it didn't. But at the same time, I was like, you know, they still maintain the consistency. So, you know, they got to Europe. But after hearing it from you, the red card problem is really... So I'm going to change (laughs) Betis to C. To, to I feel see. like I'm harsh on for for this one. I'm being like Adura to Barca. <laughs> I'm, being, yeah. I'm being very harsh, but yeah. only because I had so much high expectations for them. So I feel like maybe I'm I'm disappointed in that. Maybe that's me. So let's hear what Adura has to say before I give my final return of Villarreal because I just remembered something that I completely ignored. Adura for for Betis, yeah, I think you you actually did say it. They had a very good um, this thing, very good Europe early Europa League campaign before that nonsense against Manchester United. In the season, this season in the league, they were inconsistent. Especially Iglesias. Iglesias, that guy is very, very inconsistent. I, I, that, I you know, know I, I know I slandered him on I compared him to Rafa Mir two pods ago. <laughs> and I'm still sorry for that, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but here's the thing. Here's the weird thing about him. I agree with you. He had a drop off from the last two years in terms of performance. But he somehow scored more goals. It doesn't make sense. That's not really that's not really me defending. That's just me being confused. Like how? Anyway, go on slandering him. <laughs> I, I I think you know at the beginning of the season, everybody had the glaciers at least matching that 20 goal record or like getting to 20 goals, you know, not just no Oselu with um, this thing with Espanyol's terrible performance at the beginning of the season. Most people were, going, were saying, oh yeah, 
Iglesias can actually like have a very beautiful season this season in terms of no numbers wise, you know, and he just dropped off home. And I think that's what contributed to Betsy's inconsistency in the second half of the season, you know. And it, and it was kind of terrible for them because aside um, this thing, Iglesias, Joan me, Joan me was not fit because of his, his long-term injury. Sure, sure. I Perez was just getting into it and getting into the dynamics. So I think that affected them a lot. But they were lucky enough to get the Europa League finish. Villarreal, I, I'll, I'll be very, I'll give them a C-. Wow, we are both Because I, I feel like they're very... They're, so they are very inconsistent this season. Very, very inconsistent this season. Mm-hmm. And they and their conference league campaign, bowing out to Anderlecht. Let's let's, yeah. let's let's be let's, let's be honest here. They are. They should have been in the final. They should have yes. won the whole team, man. They should I have feel won like the competition, bro. if Emery was, if Emery didn't, win, Emery wins. The, 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 Emery he wins. Win, he wins. It. Setien does not know how to coach in Europe to save his farm. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. There were levels above every other team in that competition. Then they bow out to Anderlecht. They have consist I mean, a lot of inconsistencies in the league. And a four think, game losing streak. A, People a forget this season streak. has been really long, but these guys, they are the biggest thing for me. They considered four goals to Mallorca. A team that doesn't like scoring <laughs> more than one. Like I feel my personal hatred of Pepperina and Jorgens's performances is has really made me. I want to give them a D, honestly, because the keys I see, like, honestly, losing to LK, losing to real, giving teams that did nothing in the end points that could have gone elsewhere. They give they give LK their first win of the season. They get Premier a hat trick. Imagine. <laughs> you know, it was really blood on their hands. Yeah, and I true. think one one thing that saved their season was Nicholas Jackson's form towards the end of the mm-hmm. season. Yeah. Really surprising. And 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 how he learned to actually finish better, you know. It was a really surprising thing that happened at the end of the season. So I think yeah. every, everybody's looking forward to what happens next season. And how Setien builds up for the next season and how, and how he starts up next season. Hopefully they won't sell players like Nicholas Jackson and Chick and retain and retain them. Yeah. Or they could actually sell them for more than 25 measly million that they wanted to sell Jackson from. Like, if that deal went through, that would have been so stupid. I feel what messed up Villarreal's season was unusually bad decision making with the January transfer in John Villarreal. I normally should club. Like, selling really and not getting a proper replacement and relying on an overweight 40 year old goalkeeper to stop shots. <laughs> <laughs> Very, very big mistake. Very big mistake. Like this guy, uh, the refle- like you rarely see goalkeepers get sent in the wrong direction from open play. It's this like guy a Sunday it. league goalkeeper. Dude. It's like watching. <laughs> Buff- Remember when Buffon was in his last year in the Champions League? <laughs> it's literally like watching that. Yeah. Anyway, let's move to better and brighter things. Let's start off as soon. I think we're all going to be in agreement here and say an A because. Yeah, what a I'm season like a getting to the cup final, the amount of times he just beat Sevilla up so consistently was really fun to watch. And then, you know, they really played well in the cup final too. And they to add, add something tangible to his team, they won the sorry, they got to a conference league. So for me, that's an A. Oh, yeah, yes. I think you I think you summed it up very well. Like they had a great season. A lot of their players, be it like David Garcia, Toro, they just had so many players, uh Oros as well. And uh yeah, maybe I would give uh Abdi Abdi in there as well off the bench and starting. Mm-hmm. They they just had a perfect season for them. They finally find themselves back in Europe. Hopefully they don't get knocked out because of that uh there's like a case pending or something like that yeah. that they keep bringing back up again. So yeah. for Osasuna, you can't complain. They made a cup final. They could have won that cup final against us, arguably. And for them, it'll be interesting to see how they handle being in Europe next season. For me. Yeah. I think I give them an A to in this situation. I think one player that while well, is um, this thing, that I think people are underrated, you know, people are looking past, is Moy Gomez. 
Moi Gomez had a wonderful season. Oh, yeah, he, true. He, came, he came in from Villarreal. I think he was arguably the best player this season. Moi Gomez, very incredible season. Um, um Osasuna's beautiful campaign this season is as a result of a lot of work done over the last three years from the moment they got promoted into the league. Standing by um Agobarasate Agu- when they were facing um the possibility of relegation and Brody Vasquez coming in and saying this um this and backing his coach and telling him we have utmost confidence in you and I think that really helped them. They built this thing, a system, a community, a family, and they are rightfully they have gotten to a position they rightfully deserve. And one thing I fear for though is would they drop off next season because they have to join Europe and the league season together? Would that affect their season in general scale? Would they be like society that would have um, this in a very beautiful first half of the season and drop off in the winter? Or would they be able to combine both of them well together? Well, we we'll only we'll know in the future. So, just for time's sake, we all agree the three relegated teams get an upgrade. If, if it were up to me, LK would get an upgradable because. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, LK is a bit of a confusing one because they didn't, they didn't necessarily play that terrible, but they just couldn't get results, which was a bit confusing for me because I'd say they probably played a little bit better than Espanol in terms of performances and that kind of thing, but they were just horrendous and atrocious defensively. So, yeah, maybe I'd say I'll, I'll actually grade. Elche with maybe a D and then everyone else in F. Yeah, but the I mean for Espanol, given they they brought this upon themselves and you know I foolishly said they would finish next. Was a, well sorry, that was a tactic. Anyway, yeah, you agree that there are like all three teams deserve a fail because they literally feel the one objective they have. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I agree with that. And I think the two teams that surprised me were this in Valladolid and Espanyol. I expected Pacheta and Diego Martinez to actually have a better season than they did. I expected both of them to have better seasons than they did. And it was surprising to me, you know, especially Diego Martinez. Yeah. Well, Sevilla that let's go back to better than Sevilla. You know, this is a weird one because as much as I'd like to acknowledge how terrible they were and how terrible teams were, like, you can't deny the obvious miracle and, like, rats to riches story. Like, this this is an you know, at how you want to look at it. Because if you're talking about their relegated, their relegation worthy performances, at the end of the day, it didn't matter. They stayed safe comfortably. They almost threatened to get to Europe because all the European teams who I feel we should just give either B's or C's for their Actually, we should give all of them C's because they were just so inconsistent, except maybe Girona, who, you know, as for a newly promoted team, it was really nice. But yeah, Sevilla, they went and made another miraculous European League run. So I feel they deserve a name. What do you think? For me, I'm still giving them a C, personally. <laughs> I, I expected them to finish in seventh place. They they could have been relegated if not for Mendilibar coming in. So I think it's the same way I was harsh on Atleti for their two halves of the season, I'm mm-hmm. going to keep the exact same energy for Sevilla because they shouldn't have been in this position in the first place. They, Sevilla should never be fighting relegation. Their squad is too good for that. And then, um, But they did pull off a miracle in the Europa League, like you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Sevilla Invitational, as some people will call it. Yeah. So I will I will give them massive points. So I, I will sort of, I'll give Mendilibar an A if I'm judging him alone as like a job that he did in the second half of the season. But as a whole, with, when I'm looking at Sevilla, I have to remove points for the fact that they they found themselves in a relegation dogfight. Fair enough. Adira? I will give them a B, a very generous D. My, D or B? My, a D, D. Yeah, a D. Oh, that's not generous. I, I feel like this <laughs> season again, I'll tell you one more time. Mm-hmm. It's a 38 game season, yeah. you know? They will like for like 25, 26 games. Very terrible season. Up until when Deliver came in. There was a particular game they played before Papi Gaye got the red card, where they had already gotten to the seventh place on the live table. And I was like, 
what the fuck is happening, you know? This thing was battling relegation. How, how, many, how many weeks ago, you know? I think the job that Mendeleeva did was wonderful, superb. But, but we can't run away from the fact that their season was terrible. Some Coming from the top four finish. Hands, exactly. From the like, top four finish. To be like in the Tab said, um, I think um, Mendeleeva deserves an S, honestly. S yeah, Mendeleba, Mendeleba, if we're just judging him on what he did, yeah. I would give him coach of the season. Yeah. Even not even like on a whole I would give him coach of the season. Yeah. Well, Sampaoli, honestly, I feel like he's probably the worst coach this season because as a coach, your job is to make your players' instructions easier, not harder. <laughs> Yeah. Some probably just felt like he was just making things difficult for him. Like this is not the time to to be tinkering and experimenting and playing around as if it was like what five six years ago when he was first year at Sevilla. So yeah. Well, for the other teams, for the sake of time, I gave all of the other chasers for Europe besides Jurna a C. I gave Jurna a B. I gave everyone else C's because. They were so inconsistent. Jurena actually were really exciting. And then for the teams that were like in relegation trouble, I just gave them all a D. I gave Hatafe a D minus because why? Like, why did you sell everyone a dream like that? <laughs> catfish, yeah. Hatafe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was catfishing. But you know, anyway. And Celta as well, too. Uh, so, 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 oh, Celta D minus because you expected a lot better from them. Like, Oh yeah. Anyway, it's been a really, really, really long season. You know, we've seen some great title wins, some great cup wins, some great Champions League wins, you know, some really terrible teams, some really terrible, terrible refereeing as always. But hey, it's our Liga. That's why we love it. And, you know, thank you for supporting us all this season. So we'll see you again next year, hopefully. You know my catchphrase, I'll be there no matter what. <laughs> yeah, you guys will be there, right? Definitely. Always here, yeah. All right. So with that, we bid you all adieu. Adios. Adios.